Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Journey Latin America's Virtual Travel Club. Uh, we're delighted that you can join us this evening, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the must-see locations where to have a, a special um, anniversary or mark a special birthday, or perhaps even have a honeymoon in Latin America. So these are the places that we're going to tell you about this evening are our most iconic destinations to visit in South Central and South America, from icy Antarctica to the jungle clad ruins of, uh, of Central America. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome this evening two of our presenters, uh, operations manager Jamie Swan and one of our long-standing travel experts Mary. So the presentation is going to last roughly 30 minutes today, 30-35 minutes and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions to um, the experts um, a bit later. Um, so without further ado I would like to hand you over to, um, to Mary and to Jamie. I think Jamie's going to start the presentation so um, over to you Jamie. Thank you Laura, hello everybody. Uh, so, as Laura has just said, this is going to be a presentation about the must-see, the iconic, the places to go to once in your life uh, in Latin America, covering the whole continent. So, some of them you might expect, others might be a bit um, off the beaten track, but still worthwhile going to. Um, first, a bit about Journey Latin America. Uh, I'm sure most of you have know some of these already. We've been around uh, since 1980, so 42 years now. Um, we cover a range, we cover everything from, from Mexico down through Central America, South America, all the way to Antarctica, um, to the, the main destinations and the off the beaten track areas. So whatever you want to do, we can do. Um, uh, everything from sort of tailor-made tours going anywhere to group tours, uh, which cover single countries, multiple countries. Uh, and these are just a few of our awards and our, our sales consultants. Um, Brochure-wise, We've got two main brochures, one which is just a specialist guide to Latin America, which covers the sort of, again, the, the highlights really. Uh, it's got a few some holidays, but again, because they're all bespoke, you can we can design them as you wish. And then we have our groups brochure, which is more specific, outlining each group tour in detail with the dates, uh, departures. Uh, again, it, it covers the whole continent um, and has dates all the way up till uh, the, set, the first half of 2023. And now to Mary, who's going to start with Antarctica. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start big with uh, uh, the last frontier. Sorry, so okay, now I'm controlling that. So the last frontier in um, pretty much in the world. Um, Antarctica is, I would say, pretty much the most remote place maybe to visit. And um, as you can see, pretty big, difficult to get to, and uh, one of those ultimate trips of a lifetime. It is one of the most wonderful places you can ever be, you can ever visit. Um, it is because of it's so remote; it's quite difficult to get to. The best way um, to arrive to Antarctica usually is about is from Latin America, obviously, from the southern tip of. of um, Patagonia, where you could get a boat and then cross the Drake, the Drake Passage, which is about two days more or less of travel, of, of sailing, um, to get to the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, or you can actually fly from the south of Chile and from Puerto Arenas to King George Island and bypassing those two days on the Drake Passage. So if people were not very good on water on boats, uh, this could be a good idea. What would you like to visit Antarctica though? It's, it's, it's kind of the last frontier, it's the, it's, the, it's the place of imagination. A lot of people, all these explorers from the 1800s and before they were just trying to get here and see what it was. It is vast, it's amazing. You have incredible wildlife who are very curious. They don't have, uh, they don't have humans as predators. So they, they would approach you, they would just take a look at you and see what you're made of. Um, you can see penguins, sea lions, uh, whales, all sorts. The majority of wildlife is actually located on the on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is why you would like to go around there. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's obviously that, but obviously this sort of landscape, it is rugged, it's forbidding, um, and it just makes you dream what's beyond that. Maybe there's going to be some sort of magical space or, or, or something or other anyway. Um, but it is one of the most um, 
incredible places. It's one of my favorite places ever. Um, but also, as well as just being on the boat, you also go, you're always going to do landings in different areas in, uh, in, in the peninsula or on the east, on, on the islands around. Um, so you can be a little bit active. Some uh, companies offer more active um, excursion than others. You can do some trekking, easy, medium, moderate, or a little bit more difficult. Uh, some of them would include, the majority include kayaking. So you can just be on the water with whales, set, you know, going around you or under you. And um, you can also camp uh, on ice, which is a fantastic experience actually, because you have absolutely no light pollution and you will see the most incredible stars you would ever wish to see. So it is a little bit for everyone. It's for those with adventure and it is definitely uh, one of the most incredible places to visit. Um, and then continuing a little bit north, pretty much from the place that you would depart to go to Antarctica, you have the southern part of, of, of South America, which is Patagonia. It is an enormous region comprising Argentina and Chile, all the southern parts of these places. Um, it is so big that you actually have to make a decision. You can spend months traveling around here. Um, the most iconic places are um, Tierra del Fuego, which is pretty much where Ushuaia is, where you depart to go to Antarctica. Uh, and a little bit further up, you have on the Chilean side, you would have um, the Torres del Paine National Park. And on the Argentina side, you have the Perito Moreno, Calafate, El Chaltén, Perito Moreno. Uh, last year. So there is a little bit for, for everyone. On the bottom right, you will see a monument of um, Cape Horn. So you can actually visit this. But because it's so remote, the way to do it is on a boat from Chile to Ushuaia in Argentina. And then depending on the weather, you will be able to stop here and, 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 and walk up to this monument. So it is as remote as that. You could sometimes, um, if the weather is good, take a look at it from uh, an Antarctic ship, by the way, they can get close enough. On the left-hand side, you see Torres del Paine National Park, which is one of the most incredible, iconic places in Chile. Uh, great for the outdoors, great for trekking, but also it's a place where you can see the pumas. They're very elusive, so it's not easy to, to see them, but there are some lodges who would organize um, tracking excursions to see them. Um, and this is just Torres del Paine, it's one of the most incredible uh, national parks. And then crossing over to Argentina, you have this glacier, the Perito Moreno Glacier. It is the most iconic in Argentina. And uh, it also has the honor of being one of those few, if not the only one, I think, glaciers that are actually growing rather than um, diminishing. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a great site. You could actually walk on the glacier, but you have to be very careful. Um, otherwise, you just you can take a boat and, um, and go near the ice. Um, and just to have an idea, you can do boat trips. You can do a lot of trekking. There's a lot of cattle ranches here, in particular sheep ranches. So you can actually visit them and you can do a, a bit of sheep shearing if you, if you fancy doing something like that. And then a little bit further north from, this is in Chile, a little bit further north from Torres del Paine, you have an area called the Aysen region. It is remote, it is rather unpopulated. You don't have a lot of people here and, the, and, and cities are actually towns, not very big. But this is one of the most unspoiled areas in Chile with amazing lakes, rivers, landscapes. And the way to travel is by car, obviously you just want to do a road trip. Um, not a lot of it is paid. So it is a little bit for, the, for those very, very adventurous, um, but it is a trip very much worth doing. So um, it is in between the, where the archipelago in Chile starts, between Puerto Montt and uh, Torres del Paine National Park. Um, and then over to you, Jamie. And uh, the Galapagos. So I'm sure everyone has heard of the Galapagos, everyone has seen the documentaries, uh, but it had to be here really on this. It's one of the most iconic locations in in the world, definitely in South America. And you go for various, you go for the, the wildlife is the primary reason. It's it's the endemic species. It's sort of pretty much unspoilt. Uh, and you see, you, you just travel around and land on these islands and see the, the most amazing wildlife that you'll see anywhere, really. Um, most of them are only in the Galapagos. Some of them are only on very specific islands. Um, so you get a chance to see all of these really from bird life to sea life to reptiles to, to everything you can imagine. Um, so these are just some of the pictures. And one of the, another reason to go is just the landscapes. The, you've, the, the archipelago is 
got everything from large volcanic islands, uh, desolate volcanic islands to lush green highlands, uh, lava tubes, you've got islands like this, uh, you've got mangroves where you can kayak around, you can snorkel, you can swim, um, and everywhere you go is going to be different. And the spectacular landscapes. Uh, ways to get there, of course, you fly there from, from Galapagos, from Ecuador, uh, from Quito, it's a sort of two hour flight. And then to get around, uh, you've got countless options. The most popular way is to travel by cruise, uh, everything from 16 passengers up to 100. And they go from three night trips all the way up to 14 day trips. So of course, the longer you're there, the more you'll see of the islands and the more species you'll see and the more you'll get to experience. But anything from, from sort of a five day trip, uh, sort of seven nights is, is absolutely ideal. And you'll get to experience sort of half a dozen to a dozen islands um, and all the different wildlife, all the different activities. And it's just a great way of, of exploring them. The other main way or the other way is uh, land-based. So you've got four uh, islands which have uh, sort of towns. Only three really have any towns of any size, um, but you've got hotels on four islands. And then you can sort of spend longer based on, on individual islands. And then you can take small boat trips out to some of the sort of the islands just off the coast. And you can explore the, the main islands in much more detail. So you can go trekking uh, in Isabella. You can explore the highlands, uh, Santa Cruz, all sorts of things. So again, there's some, some trekking into the volcanoes, snorkeling. And, and there's even sort of the cultural elements. The, the bottom left is Post Office Bay, where pirates would come and leave letters and, and other whaling ships would come and then deliver these letters. And still to this day, tourists will leave postcards, which are then picked up by more tourists. And if you spot one from someone who lives down the road from you, you can take it home and take it, drop it off to, the, to, to someone who's six months later, whose who's friends or family have been to the Galapagos. Um, so again, it just offers a huge amount of variety and it's, it's iconic for a reason. And then moving on to the other side of the continent, we have the Pantanal. It's um, one of those regions where not, not many people know that much about it. It is a huge area. It's about, it's roughly the size of France. So it's not a question of just dipping in and out for the day. Um, you might want to go for three, four nights or, or perhaps five nights. This area is what you would call the washlands of the Amazon. So it is, an, it is um, best for wildlife, of course, um, but it has a really heavy rainy season between, say, December and March, where you have, uh, it, it, you have floodings all around um, and it's a bit difficult to move, etc., etc. But that's one of the reasons why this area is so lush and is so uh, fertile as well. Um, the advantage of the Pantanal is the fact that you could see uh, a lot of wildlife and uh, I just want to move, but it's not, oh, there you go. The, the advantage and now this, well, of course, the main attraction of Pantanal is the amount of wildlife you can see. One of the major differences with, um, with the Amazon jungle is the fact that because you don't have such thick forest, you can actually see much further afield and you can see much more animals. During the dry season, they tend to, they tend to get together in the dry areas, which is a little bit higher up around the river, and that allows you to see much more of them. Um, there's also the jaguar here. Um, you can spot it, it's, it's difficult. The big cats in general are difficult to spot. Um, but there are a couple of lodges who have uh, conservation projects to take, care of, uh, to take care of jaguars. So they do have tracking excursions um, within their projects. So you can actually go and try to see them. They have the expert guides who would actually say where they have seen jaguars. So you can go and see them. Uh, obviously everything made with the utmost care and making sure that they're not going to be in any way stressed. Um, but beyond the jaguars, you have all sorts of different wildlife um, like hyacinth macaws here. Uh, of different colors, or you have anteaters on different macros or, or, or capybaras, all sorts of different birds. I'm not very good at birds' names anyway, so um, <laughs> I would forget them, but you can see the variety is pretty impressive. And um, the excursions you will do here in the, on, on the lodges are most of them by boat. So you're going to get on the river and you're going to go to different areas, ideally to spot a lot of uh, bird life mostly. But obviously you're going to spot some caimans and you're going to see 
um, you can see river rotas and um, uh, capybaras all along the banks of the river. And also, is if you can also do um, safaris on land on a big jeep. You can do uh, horse riding in, in many of the lodges. So you have a lot of different options to do. You can go walking, and they would offer a lot of photography, for example, experiences because the area is so photogenic um, that you, you you would want to spend the whole day taking pictures at different times of the year, um, at different times of the of the day. So coming from the south, then we move north to the Amazon. So the Amazon is, again, it's one of those iconic locations everyone knows about. Um, it's a vast, vast area. It covers most of, well, most of northern Brazil, uh, the, the northern half of Bolivia, the eastern part of Peru, parts of Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela. It covers that whole region. Um, some areas are much more accessible than others. You've got big cities, Brazil, you've got Manaus, which is a, several million people live there. Others, you fly into an airstrip uh, or, or take a drive down and you're in remote sort of communities. Uh, but then of course, whichever country you happen to, you, you choose to go to, you'll go, you'll, you'll go out to sort of by boat along the, along the river or its tributaries um, and go to visit one of the lodges uh, and just spend a couple of days following wildlife. So this, this is, I think in Peru, so you can see this is not the, the Amazon that you might imagine the big flowing river. Uh, this is the start of it where it's much more, much smaller, um, but you've just got this landscape for miles and miles and miles. Um, let's say the, most people will stay in a lodge. So you've got these lodges. Uh, some of them are half an hour away from the airport. Um, if you want a quick sort of dip your toes into the water and, 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 and sort of experience the Amazon. Uh, others are 12 hours by boat away. You'll, you'll probably have to stay in another lodge en route if you want to go to a research centre, which you can do some sort of scientific research centres. Um, I've been to, to one of the ones half an hour from the airport. I've been to the ones 12 hours from the airport. And of course, the further you get in, the, 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 the wildlife it arguably is better, but I've seen just as much in lodges, close, or almost as much in lodges close compared to ones further away. Um, so just by going close uh, isn't, isn't going to say that it's going to be a bad experience. Another way, uh, this is particular for, for northern, northern Peru and Brazil, is by boat. So you take a river cruise uh, and also Ecuador, exploring the Amazon, and then you'll go off in, you'll, this is where you'll sleep, and then at night, or sort of during the day, you'll take small boat rides down some of the tributaries. So you'll still do lots of landings uh, and explore the jungle by foot, but during the sort of the, the your sleep on the boat rather than in a lodge. So it's a slightly different experience, uh, but there is no reason why one is any better than the other, to be honest. Um, and as Mary said, I think wildlife wise, especially big mammals, you're more likely to spot in the Pantanal because of the density uh, of the Amazon, but you'll still see plenty of, of animals uh, in the Amazon, bird life, sloths, monkeys in particular there's also a lot of uh wildlife in the river itself you've got pink river dolphins uh, you've got uh, river otters which are huge a lot bigger than that picture implies all sorts of things um you've also got the landscapes and of course the forest itself this is what's called the meeting of the waters outside of manaus in brazil where you've got the two main tributaries which form the amazon join uh one is dark water and one is uh, silty water. And so together they, they, you get this spectacular sort of meeting of the waters and then they slowly merge into the main Amazon itself. Um, as I say, you've got the landscapes, you've got the sunsets, uh, the sun rises. Uh, something of, this isn't the the Amazon, this is the Iguazu Falls, which is on the border with Argentina and Brazil. And we've included this because it, one, it, it is spectacular and I think needs to be mentioned but two, it gives you a chance to see, to have a, a sort of a, a jungle experience without going deep into the jungle itself. So you're surrounded by rainforest, um, but you're also a short flight away from Rio, a short flight away from Buenos Aires. And the falls themselves are one of the most spectacular waterfalls in the world. They're about two kilometers wide. They form this sort of horseshoe shape. You've got walkways from both sides. You've got spectacular views. It's a destination in itself. Whether you go there as a 
a jungle experience instead of the Amazon or as well as it's definitely worth including on a trip. Um, and it, it had to be mentioned as part of the jungle, even though it's not technically the Amazon. Now on to okay, Laura. So Thank you, Jamie. Um, so now to from one wilderness region to another extreme wilderness region. I'm going to be talking to you briefly now about the Guianas because I was very fortunate to travel there a few years ago. Um, and when we talk about the Guianas, we're talking about three countries, Guyana, Suriname and French Guiana. So you can see that they're, they're located right at the top of South America. But um, they're very unique in their cultures. Um, there are lots of, they're a blend of cultures and they're not actually really, it's not really a Latin American culture. But I'm going to start off by talking about Guyana. And Guyana is, you know, Mary started off the presentation talking about Antarctica being one of the last frontiers, which I wholly 100% agree with. But Guyana is also considered a last frontier. Once you leave the capital of Georgetown, which is located on the coast, the whole country is just complete, pristine wilderness jungle, lush vegetation, or grass of savanna grasslands, or massive tabletop mountains with cascading waterfalls. Um, it's a true adventurer's paradise. And the image that you can see on the screen is of the Kaita Falls, one of the most popular places to visit in Guyana. And I, I should say, Guyana receives maybe a, literally a handful of visitors. Uh, a year and that's what makes it so special because it is it's really like you're pioneering a destination um, most waterfalls that you go to to visit in latin america there'll be barriers there'll be the souvenirs stand there'll be shops there'll be buses there'll be lots of tourists when you go to guyana you will not see once you leave georgetown you'll not see any other tourists and you can literally you can walk right up to the edge of the waterfall you have to be obviously very careful, but that's the that's the the nature of this destination. It's for adventurers. It's absolutely stunning. Um, there's no real comfort as such, so you won't you won't find five star hotels. You'll only apart from in Georgetown, the capital, that, that's the only place where you'll find hotels. Otherwise, they're all sort of very basic jungle lodges. But that's the beauty of, of traveling around this destination. You'll find that you're there's only one road in the country that links with the the border of Brazil in the south and then apart from that you'll be traveling around on dirt tracks and in old bedford trucks so guyana is english speaking it's a former british colony uh, so english is the national language and cricket is the national sport um, but you head out into the wilderness and you'll see incredible wildlife when, when you stay at these lodges you'll travel in dugout canoes you'll get to see giant river otters uh, giant anteaters uh, caiman uh, 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 jaguars it's a fantastic place for wildlife watching equally the galapagos are and antarctica so it's a different type of um uh, uh, uh wildlife here but actually also if those who are uh, interested in birds um such as the cock of the rock which is the national bird of Cocker, costa uh, costa rica of guyana or um uh, it, it's it's the best place to go to and also to spot the harpy eagle so if you're looking to mark your honeymoon or a special anniversary by feeling that you're pioneering a new destination and want to visit a true wilderness this is the one place in south america that i think that you can you can do that um, but as i said so travel around the guianas is quite complicated and when uh, about 12 years ago when journey latin america was celebrating its 30th anniversary we were looking to design uh, to celebrate or mark the occasion by by creating a tour as what we did when we first when the company first launched in 1980 and when we were looking for new routes we knew that nobody was traveling to the guianas no other uk tour operator at the time offered a combination of the three Guianas, and that's because it's literally, it's very complicated to do. But as the specialists, we sussed it out, and now we offer the Cock of the Rock group tour, which travels through the three Guianas. So you venture to Suriname. Suriname is uh, uh, a, Dutch, a former Dutch colony, um, and it, the main attraction really is the fantastic uh, melting pot of cultures that you'll find there, Chinese, Asian, um, you'll also find uh, descendants from the African slaves, the Maroon community. So it's a really, really interesting place to visit. And then from there, you head over to French Guiana. So the main uh, French Guiana is still, uh, it's considered a department of France, and actually it's still part of the EU. 
Um, so it's a fascinating place to be in the, the main capital city of Cayenne. You'll be eating baguette in the morning and then you'll venture to what the, the country is probably most famous for, and that's its former penal colonies. So um, if for those of you who've seen the film Papillon, this is where um, the Devil's Island is immortalised in that film. So you can visit Devil's Island, you can visit Ile Royale, and you can... The, the, the former prison cells uh, are now historical monuments, so you can see what life was like for, those, um, for the prisoners that were, um, had to spend time there. Um, but it's also famous for a, um, its space station at Kourou. Um, if you happen to be, if your, if your visit coincides with an imminent rocket launch, then you're not able to visit the space station, but you might get to see the, the, an actual rocket launch into space, which would be pretty cool. Um, otherwise, um, uh, you can visit the visitor center there at the space station. So this is a really, really special destination for those who really want to get off the beaten track, who really have a great sense of adventure and want to do something different. Definitely consider the Guianas. OK, so from one frontier to another one and from a lush green verdant full of wildlife area to the driest area in the perhaps in the world so we start from uh uyuni salt flats here in bolivia in southern bolivia um this is really high it's about four and a half thousand meters high um we're talking about the high plateau of the andes which encompasses obviously the south of uh, Bolivia, northern Chile, a little bit of northern Argentina as well, and sort of descends into what is the Atacama Desert that goes all the way down to the coast in Chile anyway. Um, what would you visit the salt flats? Because it's otherworldly, it's a complete different place. This is a, it is a, a big lake made of salt, uh, which, you know, is where people take those pictures because they play with the, the with the, um, with the depth and you can be holding somebody here and the person is going to be behind you. It's an incredible place. Um, and because it's, a, it's, it's an area of extremes, so you have, it could be really cold in the morning, it could be quite cold in the evening as well, but during the day it's pretty hot because obviously you have a very strong sun. Um, when to visit this area, ideally you want to go between say end of March, March, April until the end of uh, November, December, because this area does have a rainy season, weirdly enough, but mostly in the Bolivian part, in the salt flat. This is um, an island in the middle of the salt flat called Isla Pescado, because uh, it has a, 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 a shape like a fish. Um, during January, February, beginning of March, there is the rainy season here, but it's just mostly combined, confined to this part of Bolivia. And uh, it creates magical landscapes on the salt flats because they flood. And you take these reflections and they're really uh, impressive. It's a unique area. However, it's very difficult to travel around when it's the rainy season. So that's why we prefer to suggest people to go during the dry season, mostly because it is complicated. The cars get stuck in the, in the, in the, in the salt flat. Um, you can move from side to side, so you have to go on the shores. So that's why it's better to go during the dry season. But one of the fantastic um, combinations you can do here is to travel from the salt flats all the way down South Bolivia, and then you cross the border into Chile, across the mountains. And this is the landscape you see. Sometimes you might see a little bit of snow, there's just a few specks up there, but it is really, really, really dry, and yet it's really cold. However, it doesn't have just one dull color. The, the combination of different colors is amazing. And also you have some, you have a red lagoon, you have a green lagoon, which all depends on the, on the minerals they have. And uh, you do see some wildlife here, not a lot, but you do see some, and in particular you see flamingos. And this is where you can see pink flamingos, because obviously they drink the water, the, the, the minerals in the water are a little bit reddish, and therefore they ended up being a little bit pink. Um, it is, it is, it's a very, um, diverse area, even, even though we might think it's just a desert. Then you cross into Chile, and this is the, this is the, the renowned valley of the moon in the Atacama Desert. Um, it's where you used to have, well, they still do some, some um, probes going to Mars, for example, because the landscape is that sort of extreme weather landscape, and it's very, very dry. But it is, it's, it's mesmerizing, the colors during the sunset, during the, the, the first light of day, they vary, they change, and it's just as incredible. 
and uh, you have these really high lagoons. Um, this part is in Chile, it's, a salt, it's another salt flat, so you have, the area is really salty, that's why you're going to find different salt, um, uh, salt lagoons, and one of, the, um, one of the mountain ranges is actually made of salt, um, called the Salt Mountain Range. Um, in the in, in already in Chile. So, and there is a lot of things to do here as well. So this is more or less generic, but you can do a lot of, it's great for outdoors. So you can climb the mountains, you can climb some of the volcanoes, but you can also do a lot of trekking on the desert. You can do it, uh, you can go by, you can do uh, four by four excursions. You can do horse riding, cycle excursions. So there are quite a few things to do. Um, and you can also here visit the, the geysers. These are the Tatio geysers. And, um, in Chile, this is just going to, towards the border with Bolivia. Uh, and at about just at daybreak, you have these incredible, huge fumes that come out. It's freezing cold, but it's a fantastic excursion. It's such a beautiful place to see. And uh, this is what, one of the excursions you can do as well. You can just go on a hot air balloon um, and gaze and see all this incredible landscape from the air. So it is for outward, um, outdoor enthusiasts, definitely. And people who like a little bit of culture because uh, as well as all these landscapes, you do have the history of the inhabitants, the pre-Columbian inhabitants here. So there are some uh, archeological sites the major village of San Pedro de Atacama in Chile has a fantastic archaeology museum where you can see some mummies and a lot of the history around there. So it's not, I mean, it's, it is great for outdoors, but it's also great for a little bit of culture as well. And uh, you will be able to see some wildlife. It's quite elusive, obviously, because it's really dry, which means that every time you spot, um, I don't know, a desert fox, for example, or something like that, it feels a bit like a bonus. So um, it is definitely another one of those frontiers that you want to visit. And within that Andean region, uh, arguably the most sort of famous of, of, the, of the sites is Machu Picchu. It's um, in southern Peru, up in the Andes, and it was, it's, it was most famous for, for the, the discovery uh, 112 years ago by Hiram Bingham, um, who discovered this citadel on a mountain, and they think it was kind of the last hiding place of the, of the Incas uh, as the Spanish arrived in South America. Um, and it's, it's one of those places that you would have seen countless pictures of, um, but when you go there and you sort of walk around the corner or walk over the, the hill and finally see it, it's, it's just a spectacular view and, and no pictures do it justice. And the setting, sort of the, the cloud forest surrounding you and the mountains surrounding you um yeah it's just spectacular and it's it's one of those areas that deservedly is 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 a must-see place it's there was a, a a competition a couple of years ago for the modern seven wonders of the world uh this is on it um and it's it's just a spectacular way to get there and and the first thing to do get there you've got various ways you've got the famous inca trail which is the route the Incas took from Cusco uh, and it goes up and down through high mountain passes, through sort of lush cloud forest, through mountain ravines, through valleys, all sorts of things, passing various ruins on the way. Uh, it's about a four day trek uh, and it's, uh, I've done it and it's a spectacular way to arrive at the ruins themselves, but you see plenty on route. There are other treks. So the, if you do the Inca Trail, it's very heavily regulated. And the only way to stay is by sort of camping each night. Uh, you can get quite nice camps, but everyone is porters are carrying your things, so there are there are limitations. There are various other treks where you can stay in lodges. Uh, they're not following the original Inca path, but they are just as spectacular and arguably less uh, less people doing them because they're they're not the regulations don't sort of say you have to stick to this path. Uh, the most common way of getting there though is by train. So train is about three hours from the main city of Cusco um, and train is, is, is how I would say 80% of people arrive at the ruins. Uh, they arrive in the small town of Agus Calientes uh, or Machu Picchu, they've renamed it to just because it needs the added, uh, I thought they needed the added boost. Uh, you arrive there and then you can, you can go and see the ruins in the afternoon. Most people will spend the night in, this, in the town 
so you can you can go up the next morning and see the ruin see the ruins again there is a few mountains that you can climb which only have limited numbers of tickets in the morning but it just means that you don't have a three hour train ride back the same day otherwise it's a long time spent on a train and it just makes it more relaxing uh journey to get there and back there are in, in this region there's huge amounts of of inca history so this is the the ruins and town of Oliente Tambo, which is about an hour and a half train ride away from Machu Picchu. So this is where the train, the road, this is where the road ends and the train, the last stop you can get the train. People do want to get the train from an earlier point. This is your final point if you want to drive some of the journey and then take the train. So this is Oliente Tambo, a series of terraces and you've, you've still got living, working villages at the base of them. Uh, this is Morass. Uh, on the left, which is a sort of ancient Inca salt pans, which is still in use today. So you'll still still see locals using getting salt and selling them at the market. On the right, you've got Marai, which is a sort of scientific experiment, really. So the Incas would plant various vegetables, uh, different terraces, and there was a there's a several degrees in temperature difference to ones at the bottom compared to the ones at the top. So you can explore all of these. This is all in this, this is known as the Sacred Valley, which has got huge amounts of of archaeology and, and sites to see, some of them very well known, others less well known. Um, and as a base, Cusco. Uh, so Cusco is the ancient Inca capital, which is now this beautiful colonial city. It's it's quite a big city now, um, but it's still got a huge amount of charm and there's lots to see and do. And there's, there's of course, there are Inca sites within the city itself. Lots of the colonial buildings and churches and cathedrals were built on top of the ancient Inca ruins below. So this would be your base where you'd spend a couple of days and then explore the valley, explore Machu Picchu and just sort of take in the, the Inca sites, really. You're muted, Mary. Uh, hello, sorry. Uh, now we're going to uh, um, what could be, if I'm not mistaken, the most remote airport in the world. Easter Island is about a five hour flight from Santiago. Uh, it is not the most remote island, but as airports go, it is. Um, and what would you visit this, this place? It's, a, it's actually a Polynesian uh, island, more than, more than Latin America, to be honest. It's just by, by chance, an accident of destiny, really, that Chile is the one who, um, who, who owns the island. But what would you visit here is because you want to see mostly the Moais, the stone statues, which no, no one really knows for sure why were they built, um, what's the reason behind them. There's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of studies about the meaning of each aspect of the statues and, and how they were transported, but to be honest, nothing is 100% certain. Um, but this is one of the major um, reasons to go. Uh, I'm just trying to move, but it's not moving. Ah, there you go. Um, also, there's one of the, an interesting fact about Easter Island, by the way, you arrive, it's just a, it's just one, one or maximum two flights a day. I think usually it's just one flight a day between Santiago and Easter Island. And sometimes the airline think they're going to continue their route to Tahiti after this. Um, but usually it would be um, just from Santiago. And uh, these, uh, the, um, the runway is one of the biggest runways, it's, it's one of, it's one of the widest runways on the world, in, in the world. It's not the biggest one, but one of them, because it was made just in case it's an emergency landing for space shuttles. So uh, it's, it's one of those interesting, interesting stories. Now, the interesting thing about Easter Island is you have the, you visit several areas on the island, which is in a triangle shape. And um, one of them would be the, um, the quarry, which is where people think they were actually sculpting the statues. And you're gonna see several of them scattered around this area. Now, the, what you see here is just part of it. The other part is buried underneath. Um, and they just don't know why they were left there or, or, or how they were transported, but you're gonna see a lot of them just hanging around as it were. Um, and then the, the the other part of the excursions that you will do is that you you visit the formations. These are called ahus, and you have several of these formations of the statues. Some of them are looking outside towards the sea, and other ones looking inwards towards the island. Many people think that it's mostly because they were um, protecting the island, or they were just trying to send messages. Nobody really knows for sure, but this is one of the the, the most famous formations because you can see the. Um, 
uh, the sunset from here, and it is absolutely spectacular. But also, Easter Island has more than just the statues. They also have some, um, uh, you can do a lot of trekking here. You can do some um, uh, snorkeling, even diving. It's a fantastic place to walk around. But there is the cultural aspect because on this, um, on this volcano on your left hand side, uh, there is uh, an old ceremonial village called Orongo, which is where uh, in, a, in a tickety well, or, or many years ago, um, the inhabitants would have a contest every year to determine who was going to be king for a year. And that was the Birdman contest where they just have to climb down that mountain, swim on the really rough sea, go into this rock, pick up a, a, an egg uh, of one of the big birds and then swim back, go up. And the first one who arrived back to the ceremonial village will be the winner and that will be king for the, for the year. Which means that nowadays they don't do that, it's a little bit dangerous, so they stop the, the, the Birdman as such, but they have a huge celebration every year in, in, in February, the first two weeks of February, uh, where they have what is called the Tapati Festival. And it's really local, this is just mostly for, um, for locals. A lot of tourists go because it is incredible. So you see they have all sorts of traditions and, and, and music and competitions between them, but it really is extremely local. Um, and it's just, it's, the culture here is fantastic. It's a great mixture between Chilean and Polynesian and uh, they have a lot of, the language is also a, a bit of a mixture. The island has only one town called Angaroa, um, and the rest is just scattered houses here and there, and then you just walk around, there's nothing else. Um, but it, it, it's, it, and you can go, it's pretty much the whole year round destination as well. But you want to come here for at least three nights, given that it's a really long journey from Santiago, and uh, there is a lot to see. Um, uh, one of the must see, in my opinion. Um, there you go, sorry. Yeah, Jamie, sorry, the light's been off. And so now we're going up to Central America um, and to the Mayan sort of sites in Central America. Uh, this is Chichen Itza, the most famous one, uh, which again was on the Seven Wonders of the World list. So this is number two out of, uh, out of seven. Um, it, the region is not just Mexico, it covers sort of quite a lot of southern Mexico, but also Belize, Guatemala, uh, parts of Honduras, El Salvador. And you've got countless numbers of ruins. Um, so some of them, Chichen Itza, the most famous one is, is a, two hours from Cancun on the coast of Mexico. So you've got flights from London to Cancun, you've got big resorts there, but of course you don't need to stay in the big resorts. So there's lovely hotels, you've got small towns, you've got colonial villages nearby, colonial cities even nearby, uh, various things to sort of, places to stay. But you've got all of these ruins to explore, uh, from the pyramids to the, the ball courts to the, the intricate carvings. They're vast sites, some of them. And as I say, some of them are, are cleared uh, and easy to access. Others are in the middle of the jungle. So top left, you've got one called Palenque, again in southern Mexico, which although this photo looks cleared, it is surrounded by jungle. You've got uh, on the on the right, you've got Tulum. So just down the coast from Cancun, you've got this, this pyramid overlooking the, the Caribbean Sea, um, and you've got other ones near, near so let me put one called Coba, which is in the middle of the jungle. So when you get there, you can hire a bike or walk around and you can just explore these ruins, jungle clad ruins that are hardly cleared and you've got countless ones like that. So you can visit all sorts of, uh, all sorts of ruins. The bottom left is not technically a Mayan ruin, it's actually a pre-Aztec one, it's called Teotihuacan, it, which is on the outskirts of Mexico City. Um, we've included it mainly because it is just as spectacular. If you're going to that region, uh, Mexico is a great city and popping out there to see, see a different civilization. Uh, you can see where the, this was years before the Mayans, but you can see where the influence came from. Um, as I say, you've got them in other countries. So the top left is in is Copan in, in Honduras. Uh, it's very easy. They're famous for its intricate carvings. The other two are in, Guatemala, there, Tikal. Um, some of you might recognize the bottom left from uh, the first Star Wars film. This is the, where the rebel base was. Um, but the, uh, it's, they're amazing places to see. You can climb up some of the, not all of them, but you can climb up some of the, the pyramids themselves and get these amazing views over the jungle. You'll have howler monkeys around you, sort of this, this wildlife as well but you'd mainly go for the ruins themselves. Um, 
and as I say, because they're in all the different countries, you don't need to have a you don't need to have a trip which goes specifically to see them. They can be part of a, a larger trip to Mexico or Guatemala or, or Belize or any of these areas. But also, you can combine several of them. So the ones in Tikal in Guatemala and combines with some of the ones in Belize very well. Um, the various ones in Mexico can be seen, and then you'll get this sort of journey through hit through the Mayan history. Uh, linked to it, it's a bit separate and a bit tenuous, but we thought it needs to be mentioned is the Day of the Dead Festival in Mexico. And this is based on ancient Mayan traditions or Aztec traditions. It's, it's uh, generally done up in the highlands, actually. So Mexico City, a, a city called Oaxaca. So you get it in different areas to where you, most of these Mayan ruins are. But again, if you're in Mexico around uh, Halloween, uh, the end of October, uh, you can see the parades, or you can also see the, the real kind of local festivities, um, which in essence are families going to, to the graveyards to pay their respects to their, their loved ones. Um, but there's lots of colour, lots of music, lots of food, as you would expect at the Latin American festival. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a time that you can combine visiting all of the, and seeing all the different cultural elements. And then lastly, onto Rio. And if there's going to be any iconic city to mention as a must visit, it had to be Rio. There's, there's lots of beautiful cities in, in, in Latin America, but Rio is justifiably famous um, with that view and Christ Redeemer, which by the is Christ Redeemer is the, is the third seven wonders of the world. Um, so three out of seven are in Latin America. And it's again, it's one of those places that, you, that I think everyone's seen countless pictures of. But when you go there and you stand on Copacabana Beach and you look up at, at Sugar Life Mountain or, or Christ, or go and visit Christ Redeemer, uh, there's just something special about the place, really. And the food and everything is, is, is amazing. And of course, it's famous for things like Carnival. So Carnival happens at the start of Lent, so sort of February, March time, depending on when Easter is going to be. And you have it lasts about four days, and you have these parades in the street. But this, the top or the the, the picture on the on the right hand side is the Samba Drome, where teams organise and they have parades, and they have people will, will be there till six o'clock in the morning, and they have votes uh, and prizes, and it's full time job for for some of these these teams and a, a very proud moment if you if you win or even just are invited to perform there and of course you've got things like the football so the sort of celebratory side of, of things in brazil is and rio is is also something to take in when you're there but the the iconicness of the city is is something which is is well worth going to see well, thank you ever so much, Jamie, and I'm really delighted that you ended on Rio. My mother's from Brazil, from Rio, and it's somewhere where I was very fortunate to spend many of my summer holidays. So uh, I completely agree. It's a fantastic city. It's very, very beautiful. There's not many cities in the world that you find uh, forest growing inside the city, lagoons, granite peaks, Atlantic coastal forest going down to the ocean. So it is, it's a really definitely a number one destination to visit in South America. Um, whilst we wait for uh, people only, if you, if you want to please submit any questions, now is the time to ask. Cause we're gonna be wrapping up in the next uh, five minutes or so. So please do ask away with any questions in the Q and A box. Um, and whilst we're waiting for any questions to pop through, uh, Mary, I wanted to ask you, I know that obviously being from Chile, you're biased with this, but if you had to recommend one special location to visit in Latin America or Antarctica, which destination would you choose and why? Well, I'm not going to say Chile then because that would be, that would be unfair, wouldn't it? Um, but of course, it's the best country in the world. Um, uh, I actually, I'm obsessed with Antarctica, absolutely obsessed with it. I think it's just... It's a, it's, it's a bucket list uh, destination. It's just so incredible. It's the, the landscape, it's, the, it's, it's how big it is. It's the, the feeling that you're really humble. It is that last frontier. And just, I've been reading a lot about all the, all the explorations in Antarctica. And you know, when you used to see all these 16th century maps and there was a no say there be dragons, that was Antarctica. And knowing that there might be dragons on the other side, it's just, it's just impressive. 
but also is, uh, is the fact that there is a treaty to protect the area and I hope the treaty is going to be continued at some point. Um, and you see all these beautiful animals who, this wildlife who are not scared of you because they, they, they just don't have human predators. And that's just incredible because it doesn't really happen in many places in the world. Um, also, you take a dip in Antarctic waters and you feel pretty cool, obviously, because you do that. But also camping in the, camping there, when all you hear is the sound of, of the glaciers breaking or of the sea and you see the most incredible stars because there's absolutely no light pollution whatsoever. It's amazing. It's just incredibly an incredible place. But also you can join in with Patagonia, obviously, so you can, you can do a longer trip uh, and you can explore Argentina and you can explore Chile whilst, you know, between uh, before or after you go to, to, um, to Antarctica. So it is also a great place, you know, a great way of joining the dots in different areas and, and, and have your, your, your feel of outdoor activities, for example, trekking or whatnot and see other areas. So that for me is the, is the top one, number one. Great, thank you, Mary. And same question to you, Jamie. Uh, so I'm trying to think whilst Mary's answering. Um, I would probably, lots of these areas, although I think we've, we've made them seem remote and difficult to get to, lots of them actually aren't too difficult to get to and lots of them can be combined very easily. So I would probably sort of visit a few of them. So for example, it's very easy to combine Machu Picchu and a uni and the Atacama or, or Machu Picchu, the Iguazi Falls and Rio, um, or even Machu Picchu, the Galapagos, um, or the Amazon and Rio and, and the Pantanal. But they, they combine so well. So I would have, I would probably pick like a cross-continent one. Yeah. So Rio, the Iguazi Falls, the uh, uni Atacama and, and Machu Picchu, just to be spoiled but I think they're easily combined. So that's what I would go for. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Actually, I spent my honeymoon in Latin America and we did exactly that. We arrived in Buenos Aires. We went up to Salta. I know this is not an area we talked about in Northwest Argentina, but then we traveled overland to the Atacama Desert and we finished in Easter, on Easter Island. So, so Mary, you'll be pleased to hear we did have some chili in our honeymoon. <laughs> that's what everybody <laughs> should do, actually. <laughs> that's a nice of honeymoon. Course. <laughs> yeah, and Rio, of course. Okay, so let's have a quick look to see if there's, uh, I think the question has just come through, let's have a look. Are there any plans for a tour through Central America from Belize to Colombia, visiting all eight countries? Um, Jamie, uh, do you want to so, tackle this one? Well, we have a tour which goes from Panama all the way north to Guatemala, uh, so six countries, uh, called the Alcyon. It's very easy to then add Belize on as a, as a finish point. The reason we don't do it as part of the tour is purely because it's already a three week trip and lots of people, for lots of people that's, that's long enough. Um, but to add Belize on is, is, is something I'd say 30% of people on the tour do anyway. Um, it's very easy. Colombia is much more difficult. Uh, you can't travel over land. There's that, the, the Darien gap is, is the only so you've got the trans uh, the trans American highway which goes away from Alaska down to down to Patagonia except for a tiny gap between on the Panama Colombia border because of the the jungle is just too thick they haven't and also I mean sort of biodiversity reasons etc they've decided that it's maybe safer to to not build a massive road linking the two continents but the 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 Darien gap is one of the reasons you can take a boat from from Panama to, to Cartagena in Colombia. Uh, and again, it's something which could be done very easily before the trip. So you could do that for a couple of days, go to Colombia, uh, travel up to, travel up to um, Panama, then do the tour and go to, to um, finish the release. Brilliant, thank, thank, thank you, Jamie. Um, that's brilliant. I think where most of the questions have now um, finished so I think we're going to have to wrap up for the evening. Uh, thank you so much to everybody uh, for joining us today and giving up your evening to, to listen to about our fantastic destinations that we're all so very passionate about and we really hope that you can join us 
on the 27th of January, which is when our next virtual travel club will take place. And we're going to be focusing on the wildlife of Latin America. We'll have two other experts uh, joining us. Um, thank you very much to Mary for posting the Alcyon holiday for me. I'm not quick enough with the technology. Um, so yeah, th thank you once again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.